Dr. Berger comes to us originally from Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and he was telling me that he was once an Ashley ranked tennis player. And he gave that all up for a music scholarship to the University of Nevada at Reno. Um, based on that, I said to him, well, how did you get interested in nutrition? And he said, it's really simple. When I was 17 years old, my thought process was as follows. I knew that people always had to eat, so I knew I would always have a job. <laughs> so that's how he ended up going into nutrition. He got his bachelor's in science in nutrition and clinical dietetics from the University of Nevada at Reno. And he got a master's in public health from San Diego State University. He finished his PhD in 2009 from Colorado State University. And he did postdoctoral work at the Oregon Research Institute in Eugene, Oregon. He has come to UNC last year in August of 2013. He is a faculty member in the nutrition department in Chapel Hill. He drove up from the main campus today. Thank you. <laughs> and one of our colleagues that we work with on a regular basis and we hope to work with in more detail. Um, the primary area of, area of Kyle's research is studying how the interaction among neural responsivity, eating behavior, and psychosocial factors in um, response to the challenges put forth by the food environment relate to habitual eating behavior and weight regulation. And he's going to explain that to you in more lay layman's terms than I can. <laughs> We're very happy to have him here. <laughs> and uh, come on over, Kyle. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Um, I'd like to first of all thank um, NRI for having me out and everyone to come and attend. Um, it's really exciting. I love, I love giving talks. Um, most of you might know academics love hearing themselves talk, so it's it's a great relationship we have. But no, thanks again for coming. And um, yeah, I think I need to change my little tagline of what I do because that is certainly a mouthful. I promise I won't. Um, uh, <laughs> There's a lot of words in there. I'm not sure I know what you mean, but yeah, we'll move on. All right, yeah, so today we're going to talk a little bit about your brain on sugar. I'm going to give you a roadmap um, of the talk, but first I'm going to give you a quiz because, you know, I'm an academic now, so we have to do these things. So you just, it's a really, really challenging quiz is pick the healthy food. And, <laughs> and everyone's laughing because everyone gets it, yet if I turned around and I asked you, pick which food you want to eat or pick which food you're going to eat, there are two very different answers, I feel. And I love broccoli, though, like the best of them. So uh, there's no, no, th um, no problem there. So <clears throat> just kind of hold that in the back of your head as we go through. We'll come back to that at the very end. But I, I'm fairly certain it's safe to say that we all would know that the broccoli, broccoli is a healthier food out of those two options. Um, so we got the quiz out of the way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of nutrition because I've learned when I give lectures, you give quizzes and you talk about history if you really want to engage the audience. Um, I'm very fluent in sarcasm. It's okay to laugh. Um, but no, I do. I will. Uh, we will talk a little bit about how nutrition, history of nutrition, and there's a point to that that will relate. And then we're going to talk about why we eat. I'm going to briefly, briefly, briefly touch on homeostatic processes, and those are your internal need states. Um, but we're going to spend most of today's talk on food reward, which is a relatively new idea of uh, why we eat. And we're going to bring in Goldilocks into that because it's really actually quite um, relevant to our food reward talk today. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the brain responds to food and food cues, and particularly sugar and fat. And then we're going to do a little role playing at the end. I promise I won't make anyone come and talk on the mic or anything like that. But you get to be your own neuroscientist. You're going to help me analyze some data that no one in the world seen because I analyzed it on Sunday just for you guys. So you get to be ahead of the curve. I mean, hopefully we'll all get it published. I don't know if I can include everyone as an author, but I'll try. <laughs> all right, so on the history of nutrition, the very, 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 very first nutrition study was actually done by an MD. And it wasn't a nutrition study, but it was James Lind. And he was a um, doctor on a British warship. And he wrote down the observation that his sailors would get sick, but if he gave them a lime, they wouldn't get sick. And about 250 years later, we know that they have scurvy, and then we would call the British sailors limeys, and there you go. Um, and it was a vitamin C deficiency. You have a lime, lime provides vitamin C. But that nutrition wasn't a science. It was no, no, no correlation of, hey, you know, this is actually, it's important what we eat. 
So we moved to around 1900, and this is the birth of nutrition as a science. Um, in 1906, there was calorie ener energy expenditure used in rats was the first time that was studied. 1912, the, um, Casimir Funk um, coined the term vitamins, which is a contraction between vital, meaning life, and amine, meaning the actual chemical structure, that it was vital, that these vitamins were critical to maintain life in his animal models. Um, now, a man of my own kind of feeling that studied eating behavior, that didn't start until psychologist Stanley Schachter in 1968 started studying obesity and eating. Um, and a, clearly at that time, obesity wasn't as nearly as a public health issue or concerns as it is now, but he was ahead of the curve on a number of his ideas. Some of his research has been disproved, but the notion was there. He started to ask very important questions. So why do I talk about, why do I talk about the history of nutrition? I, we're not gonna have a history quiz, I promise. But the, the moral of this story is, is nutrition has been only around as a science for a little over 100 years. And when you think of that in terms and context of medicine, psychology, anthropology, sociology, those have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years longer been evolved as a science. And so when you see nutrition misinformation and nutrition studies that don't quite line up, just think of it, hey, nutrition is a science and it's in its infancy. And we have figured out a whole heck of a lot in the last 100 years. And so now, places like NRI and me over at Chapel Hill and my colleagues over there are trying to promote that and push that and keep pushing it in a good direction. And it's really complex. <laughs> so why do we eat? I told you I would discuss briefly a little about some of the homeostatic regulators. Um, and I kind of refer to these as a, the need states. And these, these are in place to make sure you're in an, energy, an effort to maintain balance. So, and how these operate, there's hormones released from various parts of your body, whether it be the gut or the um, gut peptides or um, adipose tissue, you know, fat tissue, those kind of things. Um, and those are generally released and they signal hunger when you haven't eaten for a while, those types of things. So it's like your body's saying, hey, you need to start eating. And then we also have uh, fullness cues. We have hormones that are released in response. Some of these you've heard of and you know, you're know, you talking glucose and insulin and those kind of things. So with, with the satiation or the fullness cues, it's saying your, your body telling you, hey, you need to stop, stop eating. Of course, that one's a little bit trickier sometimes because the food tastes good. So um, we have these systems actually pretty well mapped out, particularly in animal models. One of the things that I find pretty interesting is these hormones, we can, we can figure out how much of these circulating hormones are happening in humans and kind of compare that to how people rate how hungry they are and how full they are. And sometimes it doesn't connect. Most of the time it does point in the same direction, but it's not as clean, you know, not scientifically as clean as we would like. Um, and if you think, I mean, we have these pretty mapped out pretty well, and it's a really, really elegant kind of system the human body is just in general, and nutrition is a part of that. Um, but nearly 70% of Americans are overweight or obese, so something else has got to be going on. So we have our, you know, we have our circle of homeostatic mechanisms, those kind of need states, and then something else is going on. So recently, as, as about, uh, I would have to say, the early 2000s, late 1990s, this idea of people are just flat out eating for pleasure. Um, came around into the scientific world. Now, if you, th if you think about it, maybe, the, maybe uh, scientists are a little slow, but I mean, everyone's grown up with comfort foods. You know, the, these, are, these are not new notions to any individual, um, whether they feel good. And if you think about the social context around eating, we tend to eat when we're celebrating, we tend to eat when we're sad, we tend to eat when we're stressed, we tend to eat when we're coming to talks about eating. It's all... <laughs> You know, it's a very, very social kind of mainstay in our life, and the food environment has changed pretty drastically. So, and it's capitalizing on this re food reward. But so, if you think of this food reward concept, and we're going to spend a lot of time on that tonight, um, but it's just simply the pleasure from eating. Um, so, simply put, um, the foods that we think that taste the best, we like to eat more of. Unfortunately, those foods tend to be high in sugar and fat. So, those are the foods that we probably shouldn't be eating a lot of. So we have this conflict already, but uh, we'll get into that. Um, so there's this notion that this food aspect of food reward is actually overriding the homeostatic mechanisms, and that people are eating more than their body's telling them. It's like, hey, you should kind of slow down, or hey, you don't need to eat right now, but I just drove by McDonald's, it looked really good, it's on the way home, it's convenient, it's cheap, why not? 
Um, so that actually, that theory that food reward is overriding those homeo mechanisms um, is pretty popular uh, as of the mid 2000s. So this whole notion of food reward, being the scientist kind of guy kind of that I am, uh, I think it's like, well, how am I going to measure this? Because there's like a billion different ways you can measure this, and it's a pretty complex thing. So I'm just going to talk a, a couple of ways um, we can do this. Um, one, you could, it's, it's pretty simple. You just ask the people, you know, as silly as that seems. It's like, how much do you like these? Oh, I like the food that much. Uh, this person actually is probably suffering from what we refer to as demand characteristics, meaning they're trying to answer what the scientist wants them to answer. So they're like, oh, no, I don't like french fries at all. I don't. I, <laughs> I, I would I I had them for lunch, but I don't like them at all. Um, so you run in you run into that. So maybe self-report isn't the best idea by itself. Um, so there's a couple other ways you can do it. You can make people work for the food. How much are you willing to work? And in this case, work is pressing a computer button, and every ten times we'd give them a little Reese's peanut butter cup. This works beautifully in kids, by the way. And then they do it, and you know. Uh, the, you know, the, the staff that run these studies, it's not the favorite because you listen to <laughs> for like hours on end. And some, you know, some of those people will go to town and they'll, especially, and it's really interesting. And when, when, you, when you start doing, instead of giving them a Reese's peanut butter cup, you say, oh, okay, we'll give you 50 cents. They'll, and they'll stop. They're like, ah, but they'll go, they'll go for the Reese's peanut butter cup. It's, there's something special about those. Uh, but yeah, so we can also assess animal behavior and or brain activity um, in response to food or when they're given food cues. Now, the, the picture of the, um, the pigeons on, the, on your left, I believe, is actually from B.F. Skinner's lab, and, uh, and we're talking 50s, and it's reward-based learning. I'm not going to get into it, but this has been around in psychology for quite some time. Um, now, this is a little movie on the right of the, um, the mouse. And basically what you'll see is you'll see a little um, line on the bottom of that when I click play. And that's actually brain activation in the reward center of the plane. And you'll see the mouse kind of walking around. And there'll be a cue on the left-hand side of that screen under that button. And that means food's coming. And then you can watch like his brain activation react to that. And then finally, the little guy will get his little sucrose pellet in the middle. So we'll see if, oh, good, the videos work. So he's kind of cruising around, and um, there's actually a tone. Oh, that was the cue. And so you can see there's a really big increase in that reward activity, and he's like, where's the food? Where's the food? Oh, oh okay, there's the food. And reward activity in that brain region is done, and it just goes back to his normal day. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll move on with that. I, want, I don't do a lot of animal work. I'm getting into it slowly, but it's, it's pretty incredible what you can do. But you can also measure. Um, brain activity in humans. And I didn't steal this picture from um, Dr. Cheatham's lab, but she has a lot of great pictures like this. Um, and so she's uh, talking in two weeks. So um, she, does, she does some brain development in, in youth and that kind of thing. And it's really interesting, pretty amazing stuff. Um, she primarily does EEG or MEG or measuring electrical impulses of the brain in brain development. Um, you can also do PET and fMRI. Now, I'm not going to talk about PET much today, um, but I will focus on, oh, that should circle the fMRI part of that, sorry. Uh, I'm going to focus on the fMRI part. Um, so you're probably like, OK, what, is, what the heck? You lost me. We're, we're in acronyms already, and it's only like 10 minutes in. Um, don't worry. I got your back. Um, so functional fMRI, again, I'll go back to the history. Just to, just to point out really how new this is, the very first fMRI was in 1990, um, 91, actually. Um, and the first time that it was used in the context of measuring something in response to food was in the mid-2000s. So we're talking less than 10 years ago. Um, so it, talk about an evolving, expensive, and interesting technology. It's really interesting to be. It's, it's consistently evolving, and you can't rest on your laurels. Um, what we have scrolling through is a picture of a human brain. This is, that's actually just regular MRI. fMRI means we're actually measuring function. Some people have MRIs on their knees to look at like MCL tears or those kind of things. Um, you're measuring structure with MRI F. The F is functional, so we're actually measuring blood flow. Great question. What is that? Oh, I kind of answered what the what is that. But so it's how we do that is um, without getting overly technical, and I'm more than happy to chat uh, later on that. Is 
it's a way to see how the brain responds um, when it's presented with specific sim stimuli or we're at rest, um, and how that does, how that works is how the brain utilizes its blood flow and how it utilizes oxygen. And when it utilizes oxygen from the blood flow, there's a change in the magnetic field of that region. And so the fMRI is actually a giant magnet, um, three or four times the magnetic strength of the poles. Um, and so basically, oxygenated blood goes to a brain region that's active, and then it's deoxygenated. And as it leaves, the magnetic field changes. And we're able to detect that change in magnetic field and kind of infer that there's brain activity in this specific region. Um, it's not nearly as, it's, it's really, we're looking at basically chop up the brain figuratively into what we call voxels, which if you think in terms of your camera, um, you have pixels, a pixel is, a voxel is just a 3D because it has volume pixels, so they're a little three millimeter by three millimeter cubes. So your brain, I always wanna make a brain out of Legos because that's what I kinda look at. And you see it, because that's the little one piece Legos, if you have kids that love Legos, I, I like Legos still, so. Um, but yeah, so, so we're looking at actually the shift in magnetic charge in, in that um, field. And we use that fMRI data um, in combination with what we know about the brain from previous studies or animal models, including lesion studies and those kind of things, um, as well as about information about the person. Maybe they're in a certain disease state. Maybe they're male. Maybe they're female. Maybe they're right-handed. Maybe they're left-handed. And then also the type of stimuli we present. Um, typically, we always present multiple stimuli, and it's a comparison. So I'll talk about, we can actually, well, actually, I'll show you. Um, the how. So what does it look like? Um, this is a not to scale drawing I did for you guys. Um, and basically you lay on a tube, or lay on a board and go back and kind of are laying down in this pretty much what's equivalent to a water tube. And through a mirror projection system, you can actually see visual stimuli. You have headphones if you want to do audio, audio stuff. But what makes um, the labs that I've been fortunate enough to work with and, and trying to continue on with is we can actually administer taste. Um, and that includes carbonated coke, which took me a year to figure out how to get 30 feet of carbonated coke administered into a magnet without metal very precisely. Um, so that's, so we, we're able to actually, and there's actually, there's a, there's a great lab colleagues up at um, Yale, because we generally get this question, is they can do olfactimeters, so they can do smells as well. Um, so combination of pictures and taste can get really fun, because you can show a picture of a, I don't know, you could show a picture of orange juice and give them Coke and see what happens and all sorts of stuff. I don't do anything like that at all. No. Yeah, exactly. Um, so just to give you an idea of kind of what it looks like in person, this is actually a little clip from a 60 Minutes um, special they did out of our, one of the sections was out of our lab a couple years back. And that's Sanjay Gupta in my arms. Um, and <laughs> I'm not, dra I actually, the, it was a very short clip that is on 60 Minutes, so my parents were not nearly as excited as they should have been. No, um, <laughs> I did loop it. We don't drown them. You could see the little video, uh, the little coke go through. Generally, we don't have bubbles either because that actually compounds the data, but it looked really good. We actually burned the camera, um, the, burned the battery of the camera for that shot, so I try and use it as much as we can because he's in the magnet. So he's in this magnetic field, and so we, the camera actually fried. No harm done to any person or a possible surgeon general or anything of that nature. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. There's a head coil that focuses the, the, the signal there. That's what you're kind of seeing. So I'm not gonna ask you to know brain regions or anything like that, but I always feel inclined. But there's three main category, three main types of brain regions that I think are important with food reward. And the first one of those, and I'll always tell you what we're looking at as we kind of flip through the brain data, um, because you guys are gonna be our own neuroscientists here near the end. Um, so the first one is visual and attention regions. And one, that, one area that's not highlighted, so that's a brain, let me see if I do this right. Okay, so that would be a brain looking at this way and if you kind of cut me in half. And so like kind of attention regions in the middle right here in the front, and we've got visual regions down here in the back in the back. Um, and the reason that's important is conveying information whether food's around or not, you can see it. Um, I'm not cool enough to do smells yet, so I won't talk about them. Um, there's taste and mouthfeel regions. And so that is a brain you're looking at, you kind of cut it right about, probably around my, yeah, right about my ears and right here 
are kind of your primary like mouthfeel. It's oral somatosensory if you want to get fancy, but it's just mouthfeel and taste regions. And those, so those are conveying information about the actual taste. And finally are your typical reward regions. And the reason we know these are reward regions is this is where the majority of dopamine and opioids are released in your body. And so there's a really high concentration of that. And that's, those are hormones or those are chemi neurochemicals that we get pleasure from. That's what results in our feeling of pleasure. Um, and so one of them is a striatum, um, and there's subgroups within there. But that's, that's, those are gonna be our key vein, brain regions for our food reward. To, oh, sorry. Oh, so that's actually, those are really hard to describe because they're like in the middle. They're, um, so they're, they come right off the brain stem, so right off the neck. So there's probably right in between my fingers now. Um, so. Yeah, at a pretty, pretty low, probably about eye, eye level, um, just above eye level. But yeah, it's, 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 sometimes you hear about it's the, that area, is, these are it's sometimes called the basal ganglia. That's a number of those regions. It's kind of in the middle. Sometimes you hear it's, a, um, it's stemming from the dopaminergic midbrain, which gets you know, kind of really close to the brain stem, kind of where you connect there. Oh, and then someone said, asked about the ACC. I apologize for putting up acronyms without explaining. That was the anterior cingulate cortex. So um, that's, that's that region that's kind of in the middle that's associated with it. No, unfortunately. Hey, preseason poll came out. We're looking good next year. <laughs> oh, yes, ma'am. Since I was 12, actually. And I was on the West Coast, so that was a big deal. <laughs> um, Great. So why would, why would food reward even matter other than what we kind of talked about? Um, the important thing about reward is pleasure from any activity informs us about repeating that activity. Um, so this, you can think of this as a very um, pretty traditional psychological contract if you're thinking about reward-based learning or reinforcement-based learning. And those are fancy words. And if you've ever had a puppy dog you're trying to train or a kid you're trying to get to, you've already done it. Um, you know, you have, you, have, you have treats when they're doing well, you have punishments when they're not. So it's really actually the core of something. It's, it's primarily driving behavior, but it is really a big part of why we do what we do. Because if, if you do something and it's a really negative consequence, you're not likely to repeat it if you can avoid it. So, so I guess some people are just gotten for punishment, though. Um, so eating isn't much different in that context. However, um, the foods that, like we mentioned before, the foods that give this really big reward response are tend to be high in fat and sugar. And so this could lead to negative health consequences down the way or overeating in not a healthy way. Um, so is there so much such thing as too much food reward or too little? And so now we're into Goldilocks. So we all remember Goldilocks, the three bears. Um, and for some reason, she never talked to the bear in the middle first, the poor middle child bear. But um, could have avoided that whole story. But anyway, so our three, and these are actually the three prominent theories with food reward and obesity. And we're going to talk about some of the data that fall within those. Um, our first one is the hyper reward theories. And so people that get you know, the most pleasure from eating and notice all the food cues are more likely to overeat. And that one makes pretty good sense. It's like if you really like eating, you might eat more than someone who doesn't like eating as much. So um, now the hypo reward, uh, food reward theories, those are a little, those are a little trickier, but we'll, we'll explain them on it as we go along. But basically they're not getting enough pleasure from eating, so they're gonna overeat to compensate. I'll show you cake. You're gonna give me all the pleasure I want. I'll keep eating you. Oh, sorry, no. Um, and then there's um, the dynamic model. And we'll, we won't get into that one too heavy because it gets a little complex. But it's a little from column A. It's a little from column B. And you try and be peacemakers between the other two food reward bears. Um, so first, let's talk about that, that hyper reward. Um, this a reward surfeit is one of the prominent ones. And this one is. Um, this one is suggesting that people that experience greater reward from actually eating the food are more likely to overeat, so it's actually about tasting the food. And there's a slight caveat on incentive, whoa, incentive salience, sorry. Um, that one is people that show greater response to reward predicting cues or like signs or smells or advertisements or someone else eating. Those people are likely to more overeat. But you can see why you kind of lump them together. The people that are more susceptible are more likely to enjoy the food part, people that are more likely 
to notice all the food cues and kind of enjoy those are more likely to overeat. Um, so those are the hyper. So we're going to look at some of our first fMRI data. And um, that one is, and we're going to compare just pretty straight up obese versus lean people. So obese versus lean people show greater activation in all our three areas, our reward, our test, and our, our taste, and our mouthfeel regions when they're shown pictures of really appetizing looking foods or shown t uh, food ads from TV, we use real live commercials, um, as well as when they're anticipating food intake. So when I was talking a little bit about um, how we show them pictures and can give them a taste, so we can kind of train people to be like, oh, here's a diamond and then get some milkshake, or here's a circle and you get some water, those kind of things. So we can measure actually anticipating like that time between they see the cue and they know the food's coming. So that's where this anticipation comes from. And it's slightly different from just showing them pictures of food ads or like food commercials, um, but pretty much the data point in the exact same directions most times. And so what you see there on that one um, that is a brain, now I'm going to have to get acrobatic on this one, it's because he's pretty much looking up the ceiling and it's about the top. So we're looking like that, and we're looking at the mouthfeel regions, which is, are right there. Those are the ones that are circled because the, that was the, the greatest activation from that slice. And what activation looks like is the brighter, the closer to yellow, um, the greater the activation. And the gray is just, you know, the brain. Um, so if you don't see activation anywhere else, like up in the front or like way at the back, there's just not activation in response to that. That was in response to them getting, um, that was into anticipating milkshake tastes, actually from one of a 2008 paper. Um, so this is a kind of interesting thing that we recently started doing is, can we use, can we scan someone's brain and kind of look at this of whether they're like to look into food images and those kind of things and use that brain activation to predict whether they gain weight in the future. Because if we can, that would actually be really helpful if you know you can come in and you scan someone and be like, oh hey, watch out, you know, you're really hyper rewards towards this food. So we actually did that. Um, and how we didn't we didn't predict, we're not, you know, reading a crystal ball, but um, we came in, they came in six, seven months, or six months, I think, this study was six months later, and then we kind of retrospectively looked at this. And we were able to find that people that were hyper that showed greater reward response to um, food images and ads actually predicted future weight gain. So it's all in the same kind of lane. It's like, hey, this is all pointing in a really interesting, pretty easy direction. Maybe if we just made food less rewarding, we'd solve obesity or something. Nope, <laughs> unfortunately not. Um, because now we have our second bear. We have our hypo reward theory of a, a body weight. And this one is a little bit tougher to grasp because it doesn't, it just sometimes it doesn't make intuitive sense. And, um, but we're gonna, we're gonna talk through some data and hopefully it'll make sense near the end. Um, so those that don't get enough reward tend to overeat in an effort to compensate. And this could be to achieve a previous level of pleasure that they had when they used to eat something or maybe at the beginning of the meal. Um, this could be just to eat to alleviate a lack of reward in general. So maybe that's driving emotional eating if you're not feeling so hot so that cake looks a little bit better. Um, so just looking at that, it's, so we're gonna look at some of the data. So you have a decreased response, reward response to food intake, not the cues, but to food intake is related to obesity. And so we're gonna look at some of that data really quickly. Um, so remember we looked at obese versus lean individuals and they showed that hyper response, that greater response to the cues and the advertisements and anticipation. Well, lo and behold, when you actually give them the milkshake, they have a decreased response. So they actually have a lower response. And then if you look at some other types of studies, um, like including pet studies, they actually have lower like receptor binding. So not even just fMRI stuff. They had lower receptor binding in dopamine, uh, and so your pleasure centers in reward-related regions. Um, so we kind of asked the same question we asked before. It's like, well, can we predict weight change or does it change when people overeat? Um, we were lucky enough in this, this study to have um, scanned people twice. And um, if you want super insider information, because I like insider information, um, this trial was actually a weight loss trial that failed miserably. 
no one lost weight, or a couple people lost weight. So we had our control group, we had our, you know, we had this great intervention, it seemed like it would have worked out great, it just didn't work out that well. But we had, we scanned them and gave them milkshake and read, you know, had their brain activation before and after. And even though the intervention didn't work, some people gained weight, some people lost weight, some people stayed weight stable. And what we found was the people that gained weight actually showed a decreased response in a reward-related region relative um, to their baseline. So they were gaining weight and they're decreasing the response. Because they were gaining weight, they had a less response to that milkshake intake. Less Less in, to the next time. In, not less in general. No, so you can see they're the they're the circled line on they're the circled line on that one. And they actually uh, they started out a little bit higher than the rest of the sample, but they their reward response declined a lot. The people that stayed weight stable and actually the people that lost weight went up just slightly, not like scientifically significant. We will get there. That's the A and B, okay. Yeah, exactly. Just hypo, yeah, yeah. So I wonder, um, did it matter if they gained weight on the intervention or the placebo? No, no, that we, we controlled for condition in, in that instance, but um, it was mixed uh, about who gained weight and who didn't. That's how bad the intervention was. It wasn't my intervention. Was it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that kind of stuff happened. Um, but yeah, no, so right, right on. Now we're under, we are a little from column A, a little from column B. Um, and these things are, this was actually a model that I worked up with my, my group in Oregon. Um, and um, so we do have, we show this hyper response to um, these cues and anticipations and then a hyper, I mean a hypo, so that's less response to the actual intake or receipt. And both of those contribute to weight gain. Um, or contribute less, less weight gain. And so that's kind of a tough thing to grab, so I always try and, try and ground it in something. So I always think a hyper response to the food cues and anticipation, you know, you might be eating more frequently, you might have greater cravings, you're more susceptible to commercials or advertisements or food cues. I mean, even if it is just the office candy dish. Um, and a hypo responsive, it's, I think it's pretty easy. I think the easiest way for me to grab this, because why would someone overeat if they didn't enjoy it? I have a tough time with that. But if you think in terms of tolerance, um, that's when things come a little bit more clear. So it's essentially what we saw in that previous slide with the people that gained weight. They showed more reward tolerance to that milkshake. So they would need more to increase that activation to what they showed um, about six months previously. So in, I, I think it's pretty easy to think in terms of craving and tolerance, and this gets dangerously close to the food addiction debate, which I don't really talk about much. Um, I don't have a s huge stance on, and I know it's really popular to talk about, but that's just not my thing. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's pretty easy to think in terms of heightened cra craving and then more tolerance, like you need more once you get it. So. And whether those are independent or they're in the same people is what we're going to look at next. So um, I wanted to turn, this is a study, a series of studies that I did um, last two years. And this is a really big sample for um, fMRI projects because they're pretty expensive. Um, and then we also did uh, a pretty expensive doubly labeled water assessment on these. But the important part of this is everything that I've talked about before has been obese versus lean or overweight versus lean or looking at weight change. Um, here, I wanted to say, and a lot of stuff happens, a lot of stuff in your body changes when you change weight. So I was like, well, what in the heck is eating behavior? Eating behavior is my thing. So um, what does eating behavior influence these things in a similar way? So we had lean adolescents. So all these, the, they're 14 to 16 year olds, great bunch of kids over in Oregon, and they're all really pretty lean, um, pretty lean BMI. And so we had an objective, it was a, it's a pretty um, complicated process, but we had an objective measure of energy intake over a two week period um, where it's measuring uh, oxygen utilization and we, we ended up assessing a lot of urine, so I won't get into that, it's not fun to talk about. But it's an objective of free living, they're just living their normal life and we can, we can determine how, many, how much energy they're actually um, 
uh, eating over that period on average. And then we also did a food frequency questionnaire of like what types of foods they were eating over that. So what, I, what the questions were we wanted to ask are is like one, are, th are any of these kids overeating? If so, how much and who are they? And then two, like what kind of foods are they consuming? Specifically, because we were giving them milkshake in the scanner, are they eating a lot of ice cream? Are they eating a lot of milkshakes? So those kind of things, because that's the closest um, thing that we're actually giving them in the scanner. And then we had the fMRI paradigm where we measured brain response during milkshake cues. So we showed them the cue, and then we delivered the milkshake as well. And we do have a contrast, so we're looking at um, um, milkshake relative to another fluid that we give them in a different cue, but that's not really relevant for today. So good enough, um, it looks like the first step where the data looked to point in the exact same direction, and this is pretty great. The kids that were overeating, so we knew this from this biological overeating, they're pretty much in a positive energy balance, they just haven't gained weight yet, um, showed an increased activity in, brain in our um, brain regions that encode reward, attention, and taste. So there they are again, the three of them. And so these are lean kids that were just overeating and during this period that we assessed them. Um, and then, um, so basically they just, the more they were overeating, the more excited they got when they saw the milkshake cue was coming. So it kind of looks like that notion of our first bear, or the top half of our column A, if you will. Um, so we wanted to see what happened with receipt. But before you get to receipt, everyone always asks me, it's like, well, how do we know they really like this milkshake? Well, that is a child's brain on milkshake. Um, and um, that region that's really hard to point to, that's kind of right in the middle, that could probably light up a small city. So uh, OK, maybe a not a small city, but a lot. So we know, we know that's a, that reward center. and. Um, we know they really, really like it, but when you take the correlation of how that brain region and then how much they're eating milkshake, it completely flips. That's negative activation we have right there. So I'll back up. It's like, oh my gosh, it's so good, it's so good, it's so good. The more they eat it, the less activation they have in those regions. So again, we have it with, we have this hypo responsivity in these lean youth. So, um, Again, we have, and this is within the same subjects. So the kids that were overeating are showing hyper-responsive to the cues. The kids that tended to eat a lot of ice cream or milkshake are showing blunted response to the receipt. So we showed nice effects with the cue and response when we looked at the milkshake, but who in the heck drinks like, milkshakes are not like the cause of obesity. So how often do you really need it? So we took this the next step and we started to look at sodas. Now, as we know, soft drink consumption is linked to obesity, poor diet quality, dental caries, all sorts of negative health consequences, and there's billions and billions of dollars spent advertisements towards youth. So we thought this is a pretty good idea. This is a pretty good target um, to test next because a lot of people drink sodas or soft drinks. So we asked the question is, how does the brain respond when drinking Coca-Cola Classic and um, seeing cues or advertisements for that? Um, well, in the cues, this is a cues. So we had 25 adolescents, which is a fair size pilot study for fMRI stuff, and they're pretty lean, not as lean as a previous sample, um, but again, around 15 years old. Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but that brain activation is in response to the cue for the Coke. Um, it looks very similar to the Coke advertisements relative to different advertisements, but I just put this one up. So this is anticipating that the Coke was coming, and they get a lot of reward activation, a lot of taste activation, a lot of visual and attention activation again. But not so much when they actually received the Coke, um, which was surprising. Um, we were kind of hoping that this would be a little bit more, it's there, it's just not nearly, if you think back uh, two slides ago and I showed you how much they like the milkshake, that's what this should look like in my head, in my perfect scientific, this all will work out head. You do see some mouthfeel regions, which are um, oral somatosensory cortex, which are circled up there, and then um, <clears throat> kind of a dopaminergic uh, midbrain little peak, which is one of those dopamine reward areas there, but not nearly as much as we thought it would happen. Um, so we saw some nice effects with the milkshake, not as much with the Coke, so maybe it has something to do with fat and sugar. Um, we know that milkshake and soda are very different foods in general. We're forced to use liquids because they have to hold their heads incredibly still when they're in the scanner. 
Um, so we can't be like, oh, here's Doritos. Like, yeah, I want to, don't worry, I'm working on it. Um, but we're trying. And interestingly enough, I did, um, the dietitian part of me did some nutrient calculations on the milkshake we use, and it was actually higher in fat, clearly, but also higher in sugar than the, than the soda. It was a pretty, it was a pretty good tasty milkshake, actually. We use like bright, I mean, we, uh, we use Haagen-Dazs and like organic milk and all sorts of fancy stuff, I don't know. It was, um, yeah, it was a pretty tasty milkshake. So, um, we designed our next study with milkshakes that have different levels of fat and sugar. So they're all chocolate milkshakes. And this took a while, but we, we have a, and I'll get into it, but different levels of the fat and sugar. And then we went around, and I tell you what, if you want to make new friends in an office building, just taste test milkshakes. And everybody loves it. It's like, oh, taste this one. Oh, taste this one. Is it different? And, you know, so they, they were, every, all of the milkshakes were rated pretty palatable. And, you know, people are like, hey, this is a pretty good milkshake. This one's better than that one, but this is a pretty good one. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna pull, we did, we, we've published one paper from this um, study, but that wasn't even on the full sample. And, and so I analyzed the full sample from that, some of that stuff tonight. So you're gonna help me analyze the data. We're just gonna click through it. So that will be fun. But first, I'll give you an idea who the kids are. These are 131 healthy weight te teens from Portland. Um, so they're gonna do the milkshake paradigm, like I said. Um, but this time they get four different kinds of milkshake and then there's also like a tasteless contrast solution that we use, that we have to use. Um, so the first milkshake, just to give you an idea, and I'll put these numbers up um, as we go through the milkshakes, but I just wanted to give you an idea relative to compare all the different types of the milkshakes. So this first one for about 100 milliliters, which how many milliliters we got? So half of this, a little more than half of this, we have 170 calories, nearly eight grams of fat, and 23 grams of sugar. That thing is intense. It, it was good, you know, I mean, it was to the point, and we had to make it because we wanted to be able to have enough difference between the high fat and the low fat and the high sugar and the low fat, or low sugar. Um, we had to make it pretty intense. I mean, we're using like, cream instead of milk and stuff like that. You, you, would, you would say, oh, this is gross if I gave you the recipe, but if you tried it, you'd be like, hey, this is not bad at all. <laughs> not bad at all. So that's a high fat, high sugar. So that's, that's the big bad daddy of them all. Um, we had a high fat, low sugar. So that was 124 calories. And you can see we cut the, fa the fat by a quite amount, uh, only two grams of fat, which is pretty challenging. Um, we didn't use any artificial sweeteners, any artificial anything like that. Everything we use, we could buy in the store today. It's just basically skim or fat-free milk up to half and half, and then the same kind of um, slow churn ice cream, actually. Um, so yeah, so we had 124 calories, about two grams of fat, again, on the nose, because we got lucky, <laughs> 23 grams of sugar. So the sugar is almost exactly, exactly the same. Now the low-fat, high-sugar, this one was a challenge because we wanted to make it the same calories as the, uh, yeah. Oh, do I? Shoot. No, oh, yeah, see, that's a danger in this. I've done this like 75 times. I'm so sorry, but no, it wasn't, but you guys all passed. Great job. <laughs> Milkshakes on me. Let's go. No, um, yeah, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Okay, so well, and so just just by the um, by the uh, copy and paste errors, it will be flipped on the next couple slides just to give everyone a heads up. But the calories, <laughs> the calories, you get the point though. Um, so this one, so yeah, no, so the low fat, the the low fat, high sugar. Oh yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. So in the actual high sugar milkshake, we have 23 grams of sugar. In the actual High fat milkshake, we have about nine grams of fat. But the, the cool thing about that, and whether it's flipped or not isn't really that important, but the high fat low sugar and the low fat high sugar have almost exactly the same amount of calories. So you can look at the relative effects of fat versus sugar um, without any concern of this is providing more calories than that, so we don't really know where any differences come from. And then the low fat low sugar, which is pretty much glorified water. Um, <laughs> Well, especially after you have the first one, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. It's actually not that bad of a milkshake if you ate it by yourself, drink it like kind of on its own. But it's, I mean, still, if you think of half of this bottle and you're getting 74 calories, three grams of fat and nine grams of sugar, that's still a fair amount. 
Um, if I, uh, in one of the papers we did, we, you can bring it up to scale of like, if you bought it at McDonald's and it's like, the top one is, uh, this is dangerously close to over a thousand or a thousand or so calories, stuff like that. Which actually isn't that unreasonable if you start looking at nutrition facts labels, <laughs> but that's all right. Okay, so we have the high fat, high sugar. We know this one's good to go. Um, so the high fat, high sugar. So we're gonna look at reward, taste, taste and mouthfeel regions, and I'm not gonna quiz you on which is what. Don't worry, I got it we all color coded here. Um, so in the box now, we're looking at reward regions. And you can kind of see in the, in the box on your left, um, there's a little bit right over there in the corner. And then in the box on your right, there's some in the kind of back right uh, back left corner on the thing. So it's eliciting some of the activation that we'd anticipate, and that's, that's pretty good. That's a that's pretty good reward region activity. And now we have taste, and uh, apparently really activated the taste cortex, um, and primary taste cortex, because that's pretty activated, and as well as if we go right to the mouthfeel, again, that, that spot kind of above your ears. Um, and it's kind of interesting when we get into this, um, just because I know we're all role playing that we're neuroscientists right now, um, fat isn't necessarily a taste as much as it is a texture. Um, so I see a lot of people that I think probably cook a lot real, and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, of course, I gotcha. Um, but yeah, no, it's kind of an interesting concept that people don't necessarily, I mean, you can get down to fatty acids and I'm sure someone does that around here because there's amazing science around here, but you can actually taste fatty acids, but it's more for any given person, it's more of actually a mouthfeel that you're reacting to fat. And that's where you'd see this oral somatosensory kind of activation. So we're gonna look at now, um, this is whether, independent of what the calories and say, this is the high fat one. Oh yeah, no, so this is all right. Okay, cool. So this is a high fat, low sugar milkshake. Um, so again, we're gonna look at a reward, taste, and mouthfeel brain regions. And again, it's like, well, well, yeah, there's a little right there at the top. Um, there's a little of that brain activation. It's not nearly as much as if you think back a little while ago when we saw that milkshake that was pretty palatable, that was exploding with action. Um, taste region, there's a little bit there. Um, actually, I was, I was struggling to to find a slice that would, it would show it, but I know it's there, but not that much. Um, Mouthfeel, it's there. Um, it's kind of interesting because we're dealing in 3D, like a brain that's 3D, so I can only show you in 2D. Maybe 10 years from now, we'll have some model that I can point to, and actually the brain. But if you go back a couple slices, um, you'll see a lot more mouthfeel activation in this one, um, which we would anticipate because it is higher in fat. So you just can't quite see it on this slice, per se. All right, so we kind of, okay, we know that one. So low fat, high sugar, whoa, hey, there we are. All right, so let's check it out. Reward region, yep, it's there, and it actually bled into a reward region that wasn't even activated in, um, <clears throat> in the previous milkshakes. Taste region, yep, that's lit up pretty well, too. And then the mouthfeel region, it's still there, too. Um, and I, that might be some of the um, spray of activation from the highly activated taste region, but it still does contain some fat, so you'd still anticipate that it would activate this mouthfeel region. But um, without, um, just for ease of not having to remember all that information, I'll just throw them up. So here we had our high fat, high sugar, pretty solid activation in our, in our three regions the high fat, low sugar, and this is pretty high in fat, um, and not too much activation going on. And then lastly, our low fat, high sugar. So everyone here that now has a neuroscience degree knows which one of these is the fan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Low fat, high sugar, yeah. Uh, these are 15. 15 and lean. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, no, completely. And we haven't, we actually, and, and, and with brain development sh for sure as well, if you start looking at behavioral control regions and prefrontal cortex, that doesn't fully develop in males in particular. This isn't a joke, I promise, but until like the mid 20s. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. You see the reverse, and it's really tough to find lean grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to find predictors of weight gain. 
and generally lean grown-ups tend to stay lean and they're unfortunately not a huge part of the population. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there we go. That's a, that's a question. Mm. Um, there's been a... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, no, exactly. No, that's great. That's great. Because when we had that, no, I won't. We're good. Artificial sweetener. No, no, exactly. Um, no, so it's, uh, so basically it's, that, that has to be, there has to be a little fat. And I think, um, you call it a ceiling effect a lot of the times, is I think our high fat in this study is too high fat. And I think it became not, not very appealing. I think it got too fatty. And that's why you don't see the activation in the high fat as much as you think. But when you look back at, we had that soda, and there wasn't that much, but you have basically equivalent amount of sugar, but with just like a little bit of fat, you get, a, you get some really solid activation. And I think that's just the combination that the majority of the, this population is reacting to. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry? Yes, I never thought of it in those terms. <laughs> you don't happen to work for Kraft, do you? <laughs> no. It does have a different fat. It does. It does. The mouthfeel, and and we did subjective ratings of that, and there were significant differences for texture for the the two that have high fat relative to the two that have no flat, no fat. Which I didn't present the low fat, low sugar data because it's really boring. It's just looking at like empty brains, but. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're really smart kids, don't get me wrong. No, but um, yeah, no, so it could be a combination of that it's adding that texture that makes it a little slightly more appealing. Um, and we also did pleasantness ratings of all these. And interestingly enough, um, the kids found ranked and rated, if you want to get specific, the high fat, high sugar, their favorite. Even though it didn't exactly line up with what we would say on the brain data, um, but the low fat, high sugar seem to be elicit the most. Yes. Yeah, so we have one of the most bizarre inclusion criteria of muscle like chocolate milkshakes. Um, no, but we actually had, we, because in this sample, it's tough to, it's, we have to pay people for, to drink milkshakes. It's not a bad gig, you're just laying there getting a milkshake. No, but um, we're, we're actually scanning these people every year for the next four years, uh, the, the sample, and two of them have already gone vegan. And so that's where dietitian Kyle finds really good dietitians and we try and figure something out. Um, but, and in, in particular, like during, I'm con I was concerned with, because we're giving them these four kinds of tastes over about a 30 minute period where you drop, 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 and you get a little water, you're just laying there and like, hold still, drop, drop, drop. I was worried they just get sick of it when they're in there because we're giving a lot more by volume. Granted, it's only about three or four ounces total, but as you're laying there and there's nothing else going on, I mean, it would it likely becomes less appealing, which actually is something that I've recently started to do in a very um, scientific way that people haven't quite accepted yet, but I promise it's right, um, is analyze brain activation over time as they're getting this. So I can actually measure it when they first get it, as they go through, and then, which gets kind of some interesting things around that reward learning talk. I won't forget you. Oh, no, yeah, that's fine. No. Yeah, so the, que the question was, and I'll, I'll just summarize if that's okay, is what, what kind of Coke did we use? And, um, and citing that if it was like the Mexican Coke that actually uses um, straight sucrose versus something that's high fructose corn syrup, which is, if that's what the point you're getting. Um, the reason we chose Coke, um, <clears throat> and I will answer your question, this seems like a caveat, but it's not. Um, the reason we, we chose Coke, it was, um, even Diet Coke outsells Pepsi, which is kind of interesting. Coke and Diet Coke outsell Pepsi, and they're more heavily advertised in our age population. Um, so that, that was the rationale behind choosing Coke relative to Pepsi or something like that. Um, no, so I'm actually, as of today, this is a good news book, um, I'm funded to do a study where I'm actually using fruit juice now. Um, <laughs> which I will tread lightly. Um, but no, but your point is, is whether um, 
the, it's a really kind of interesting thing. There's a gentleman up at, uh, in, in Portland that was trying to get, to see if he could different, see the difference simply just between straight sucrose and straight fructose. And the only way he could see a difference using fMRI, and you know, I actually had set up his lab with the taste protocol and that kind of thing, um, was to use an NG tube. So it was a metabolic difference, it wasn't a taste difference. So it, and it, which will now relate back to your question about artificial sweeteners. There's been three or four by, you know, really good groups around artificial sweeteners, and they do show some differences between neural response to like a sugar, like a sucrose, or um, relative to an artificial sweetener, whether it be aspartame or sucralose or whatever, the phenylalanine, whatever they're using. Um, but what you can't do in adults is you can't sneak in artificial sweetener. It's, well, actually, I shouldn't say you can't. It's really hard, and the labs that have done this yet don't, um, they're neuroscience labs, so they haven't figured out the food side of it, and that's where we come in. Um, but it's, they can taste the difference. So if you can taste the difference between, and everybody knows that difference between a Coke and a Diet Coke or a Pepsi and a Diet Pepsi and those kind of things. And if you can taste that difference, you have no idea if the difference is coming from the actual I don't really like this taste. This is foreign to me, depending on, independent of which way you're looking at it. But um, I don't, um, or if it's coming from like uh, what the fundamental sweetener is. Um, that's a beauty behind kids. Um, we, did, we did some, uh, in three to five year olds, we were kind of preloading them with a sugar-free Kool-Aid and a sugar-full Kool-Aid and then just measure what they eat later. And it was a really kind of cool way that we can show that kids can actually sense for how much calories they drink before a meal without even realizing it. You lose that age by the age of six or seven, so don't worry. We, we're, it's all long gone for us. But the beautiful thing about kids in that context in which we're starting to start to scan younger and younger is as long as it's red, it's cherry, and it tastes great. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, no, well, <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, as long as it's red and cherry and it's sweet and uh, it doesn't come in that weird thing where you have to measure the, yeah. No. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's pretty clear that a lot of sugar with some fat really gets your brain going. Um, and whether the food industry knew this 10 years ago or not is up for debate. <laughs> um, so, wh <laughs> so why does it matter whether a lot in sugar and some fat creates all this brain activation? And this is kind of coming back to that thing of, you know, it's because really reward guides are behavior. So it's like, oh, it feels great, I'll do it again. It made me feel better, it'll do it again. Oh, this is terrible, I should probably avoid this behavior in the future. Um, whether you realize it or not, there's a lot of that going on, and that's part in the reason we survive. Um, I won't get into cross-sensitization of other activities that feel good, but um, it's part of our survival, it's part of the anthropological aspect of our life. So. And the problem is, is repeated intake of these really, really, really rewarding foods can result in an increase in awareness and food cues and cravings and possibly a tolerance that makes you want to eat more. Now, those are, those are May statements. Those aren't proved yet. Um, and there are certainly individual differences. Maybe some people, it's for, from column A, some people it's column B, some people are both, some people are neither. Um, we just need to find those neither people. Um, and the interesting thing about this is we tend to forget that foods high in, high in well, I tend to forget not we, um, that these foods that are high in fat and sugar tend to provide calories too. So now we come back to our quiz. Um, and we know that most people know that um, the donut isn't as good. It's not really providing many vitamins or nutrients that are actually healthful, and it's pretty high in fat and sugar. But what you know now is that the, bono, the donuts, donuts probably are affecting your brain as well. Um, it might increase your cravings, it might result in tolerance, so it's really hitting you double whammy style. I mean, it's bad for your body, it's bad for your brain. Um, so that's gonna bring me in um, to home stretch. And again, I wanna thank NRI, um, my colleagues up at Yale at ORI, which is my Oregon Research Institute friends, and some colleagues over at Stanford, and of course my funding sources in UNC. Mm. That's a great and one. And also, were any of the scientists you knew or any of the people involved that it would be as good as a weight that you're trying to Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> great. Two great can, questions. Kyle, can you repeat the question for people oh, who didn't certainly. hear? And I'll, I'll pass around a microphone for anybody okay, else. Great. Yeah, no, so is it two-parter? So the first one is, I already forgot. Um, 
I know. Time of year, excellent. Seasonality affects the seasonality. So uh, when the when the participants were recruited, and and um, I'll answer that just because um, there it took a year and a half to recruit um, the sample. There there's some characteristics that sample that I didn't discuss today that uh, made it more challenging to recruit. Some of them had overweight parents. Some of them had lean parents um, because that's an innate risk factor for future weight gain. Uh, we did see differences there, but that's a whole other science story. No, 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 hold on. Yeah, no, no, I got you. No, I was just talking about it. Just, it basically, that was a roundabout saying. So it took a long time. It took a year and a half or two years for us to recruit that sample. So we scanned through all the seasons twice almost. Um, and now, um, now, so this is really interesting. This is actually, this is an eating disorder prevention lab. And inherently, it's incredibly fit. I struggled with my weight considerably. I was in like a wheelchair from a foot surgery before I started playing tennis and music and all that jazz. There's another fun fact. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about fun facts. Um, but yeah, no, and both my parents struggle with weight and those kind of things like that, certainly. And it's, and it's not, it is a struggle and it's not easy. And I think the more kind of information that we understand about how the brain kind of works, it, it, it can't, it, not, it doesn't directly help in like, hey, we got it, we can fix it, here's a pill. But I think it provides a lot of really valuable information. Um, or at least I hope so, um, is my job and all. Um, so to move forward, integrate, and so we're doing some of like uh, we've recently done a, uh, um, a um, uh, oh, it was a weight loss. No, it was a weight gain prevention trial. So people with weight concerns, and they come in, and we are trying to change how their brain responded when we showed him cues of food. And so based on the information you know, it's like, hey, you're taking care of that column A right there. That would be awesome if you could knock that out. And so when we had, it was repeated practice of when you see this picture of food, instead of thinking how yummy that tastes, or not thinking at all and be like, I don't really need to eat that right now. I'm not hungry. Or that might have a long-term health consequence and stuff like that. So we're trying to use this. And actually, we're now working on some um, in real time feedback where actually people can see their brain activation as we show them cues to try and help them figure out whatever is going to work best for them. Yeah. Oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. How about that? I'll be much more optimistic. Um, before, while well, she's doing the mic, I will want to, there's one last slide on this guy that's coming up. Does it come up on the uh... Nope, no slide. OK. Um, I don't know if it came across in your printout. If there's one last slide and it looks like a girl from the Lay's potato chip, yeah, homework. No, no, but I just wanted to give you two and for two. There, one of them is a 60-minute special on sugar, and it gives a much more comprehensive view. It's available on YouTube. It's available on their site, but it is a full 60 minutes, ironically. Um, um, but that's a really, really, uh, it's a really pretty well done story by Sanjay Gupta and um, friends. And you can see my arms on TV again if you want. Um, but the other one is by a colleague, Nicole Avina, who primarily does animal work. But she did a TED cartoon. It is five minutes. And it probably did a better job explaining all this than I did in five minutes. It's brilliant. It's on YouTube. It's free. It's cartoons. It's brains. It's sugar. It's amazing. So I would just encourage you to check those out at that point. But. Is there any data as to what the ideal fat sugar ratio is to create this electricity? I mean, what's high sugar and what's low fat? Not that people outside of the food industry know. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you a quick story about the Dove Bar. Um, you know, like the Dove Dove chocolate and Dove Bar. Yeah, it is in a great Dove Bar. And so, in in the early '80s, I, I knew a researcher there, and I know a lot of people that work in the industry. I'm not back in the industry. It's, um, they were doing samples and taste tests of every common, every feasible combination of sugar and fat to determine what the ultimate concentration that would be most appealing to the mass public in thousands and thousands of people in the 80s. And our science just isn't there yet. Um, um, and I don't, I'm not trying to say that they were doing it for evil genius purposes or anything in that way. It's just, they're, they're ahead of the game for a while. And, and it's great, and I know a bunch of them, and they're, they're, they're great people, they're smart. It's just, um, we're working on it. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pay taxes. Yeah. 
No, it's moderate sugar. I know because what. And, so what it, you know, you got to you got to think in terms of the contrast we're using, which is calorie-free, taste-free, and it matches the osmolality of saliva. Actually, so it's just a liquid that has no taste. Um, but it was you, we wanted to avoid a floor effect um, with having something that was too so close that you wouldn't come across it in in a naturalistic environment, and it's so close to our control solution that you wouldn't see any activation. <laughs> I should read labels. <laughs> There's the percent. But I mean, the, the point is, I mean, you know, I mean, you completely understand how science is, though. I mean, you want to start at the tails and work your way in. Because if we did this study and our didn't see differential activation between the high is too high, like I talked about. I think the high is too high. I think we reached a ceiling effect there. I think it asymptoted. But if we did this study and a fully powered fMRI study, which there aren't that many of, and come across with null effects between high fat and high sugar because there are tastings that we provided were too close, that's bad information. Um, that would discourage further research in that, that direction. And I, I think that, I mean, whether I walk a fine line between bench science and applicable science, and sometimes stuff in the stuff in the lab doesn't work for stuff in the real world. I think that it's just to say that the low fat kick Intamin's made a fortune with low fat. You look oh, at yeah. the sugar content, it's way up there. Well yeah. You know, so we go into these sort of fads without yes, good research knowing what it's really mean. Well you know, so if you think about it and I was actually talking with a Karen, a colleague of mine about this, um, it was low sugar, sugar substitutes came out, then everything had a lot more fat. Then it was low fat, and, and then high sugar. And then it was low carb. And low carb worked for a little bit, even though it's back actually from the 70s. Low carb worked for a little bit because you could only shop in two spots in the store. You could shop in the vegetables and you could shop in the meats. And then the next thing you know, two years later, you have low carb Snickers, you have low carb tricks, you have low carb everything, so then it doesn't work. So it really just comes back to that moderation and volume thing. avoid the food addiction debate because this looks like we're all slaves to our neurological responses. Yeah, um, I'm really good at avoiding the, the food addiction debate. <laughs> um, I'll, I will give you my canned political answer for that and then I will address the rest of your question. So how I, the food addiction people really like the stuff that I do. I think it's, and I'm, I'm happy that there's advocates like Kelly Brunell who's a, a pretty good friend of mine and the, the Red Center for Policy, and I'm all for taxing sodas, that's fine. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I don't get into, and I don't want to trivialize other addictions that I know are considerably, probably more serious and have negative health consequences by labeling that um, food addiction. It's not, I don't think that it's my role. And I think my biggest frustration with the food addiction thing is, which I understand there's gonna probably be down the road, um, whether it's a diagnosable criteria and those kind of things, and now insurance is involved, and who knows where that's gonna go. But um, I think there are a bunch of incredibly smart people, way smarter than I am, that are spending way too much, way too much time bickering about a label, when I think if we all sat down, we could agree that this kind of stuff is happening, what we call it, it doesn't really matter, but this is what's happening, so let's figure out a way to combat it, let's figure out a way to <clears throat> deal with it. Um, why is it happening now? Is it happening now more? Is it happening now less? So um, that's how I avoid that one. Um, <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> Did I answer all your questions? You kind of had a more, oh, I don't, don't feel hopeless. Um, that was that. That was the other, I should, probably should have started with that one. No, don't feel hopeless. We got a lot of really smart people and it's young science. Um, there's a lot of people that don't believe fMRI is really telling us anything important. So what you do is you just do better study designs. You replicate findings and you start testing out unique interventions about biofeedback and cool stuff. You start looking at genetics. You start looking at other risk factors, you know, and you start looking at, my big thing is, is you're looking at kind of objective biological measures you're looking at actual um, behavior and you're, actu and you're looking at um, individual's perception of what's going on because most of those times, those three don't line up. And, but they all might line up in one little spot 
and that spot where they line up, that's where truth is, I think. And that's where we'll start making a difference. Tell us a little bit about sugar substitutes. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so there's going to be some really, 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 really cool stuff coming out about sugar substitutes here in about the next five or ten years. Um, one of the most, I know, I know. Well, that gets back to it takes a long time to do science well. Um, um, so one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating about sugar substitutes, and um, if anyone was really curious, before I did that soda study, I was probably a 40-ounce a Diet Coke a day guy. I, and that's no lie. Like, and that was because I switched from regular and lost a bunch of weight, so I was excited. Um, but now I'm just drinking a lot of coffee because it <laughs> helps out with the job. <laughs> Won't get into that. Um, no, but sugar substitutes, I think, so the, the big thing with sugar substitutes, and it's a great question to ask from a scientific standpoint, because you have epidemiological data that will say the more people use sugar substitutes, the more likely they are to gain weight, the more likely they are to be heavier. Um, but then you have a randomized controlled trial, you know, the gold standard of science, where you take someone that's drinking a regular drink and you stick them on uh, like a regular soft drink or something like that, you stick them on a diet or something like that and they lose weight. So you right there, you have a great question to ask of like, hey, what's going on here? Is this good for losing weight or is this bad for losing weight? And I actually think it's good for the short term and bad for the long term. And that's where it comes down to because I think <clears throat> there's, in there, there's two animal papers that came out and then one that I probably shouldn't talk about because it's not out yet, um, that aren't mine, um, that would suggest that basically with a sugar substitute, you get that sweet taste on your, son, your tongue, you're getting that reward switch flipped on, but then calories don't come with it and so your body freaks out. And it almost goes into like a starvation mode, so other foods, this is cross sensitization mode, other foods that you know have calories all of a sudden look a little bit better because you're a little concerned because you just had that sweet taste and the calories weren't there. So what's gonna happen next? So it's almost like your body's going into starvation mode because we know that um, dietary restriction, this is one of the studies we did before, um, the more you fast, like the longer since you've eaten before, and you can do it systematically or it can natural vary, vary, uh, naturally vary across the sample. The longer it's been since you've eaten, the reward value of the food and the attention to food goes up. So I think it's a similar thing like that, except you're actually consuming something, I think. And you could be priming yourself to be used to that ultra-sweet taste. So when you have something that 10 years ago you thought was sweet because it's an orange and it's in season and it's great, it's like, well, that doesn't really, that doesn't really do it relative to my sugar-free latte or whatever you got. Um, but sugar-free vanilla latte, I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 no. I mean, I, I know you're a registered dietitian, so I, I know you're coming from a little different background than I'm coming from, yeah. but I'm just curious because no, I'm I mean, not hearing any of that. Oh, no, it's just, you know, you gotta, you're, you're limited in the scope of what you can do well. Um, and I, so I'm expanding, actually, we're expanding, I'm gonna start, start doing a lot more um, blood hormone work in response to the feeding protocols and those kind of things and a little more trials on those lines. But no, it's 100. And then you start like upping it with certain disease states and those kind of things like that. It's, it's um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting stuff for sure. Okay, we're gonna take one more question and then I believe that, and you had your hand up for the longest period of time, and then I believe Kyle's willing yeah, to around. stay around and answer right. any questions that you have afterwards, but the folks that need to get on out of here, we're gonna let them do that. Uh, the first question, I'll make a comment question. Where does salt come into the polymers? Because oh, yeah. I've always yeah, understood there's salt. the trilogy, the salt, the sugar, the fat. Yeah. Um, so that's a really interesting thing, especially when you start looking at, um, it's, a, it's a minority of the population, but they, they really dig the savory thing. They're not sweet people. They don't have a sweet tooth. Um, so we, we haven't started... <laughs> this is going to actually sound rather embarrassing, but this gives you the idea of the state of the field. I couldn't find a high-fat, salty liquid that would be appealing to get in the scanner. <laughs> That's like not salad dressing. Yeah. I mean, nacho cheese, I tried getting it through the tube, but it's, it's just like, but no, it's totally a great point. There's some really good work at a Leeds University about implicit measures of kind of like timed reactions, and they do a really nice job at separating out like a, a high-fat salt, a low-fat salt, and high-fat sugar, low-fat sugar, and those kind of things, but definitely something we need to address in the future. And then the quick comment back to yeah. her, her point was that once you see this data and you understand it, 
Wouldn't it be more like exercise? I know nobody likes to do it, but it comes down to self-discipline. Mm-hmm. I mean, I fight the, the fight like this because I've got mm-hmm. some health issues yep. Excuse me, with sugar, mm-hmm. but, and, and I find myself breaking down. But it's one of these things where I think once you see the data, and it's real, yep. that you know you just have to have the discipline to walk away from it. Yeah. Correct? So we do, that's the, other, that's the other side of the coin. I did a lot of discussion today about the gas pedal, the green light, the food reward, um, but lack of behavioral control. Um, or decreased activation in di- dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is your behavioral, your cognitive control region, is right up in there. Actually, I, you can come up, I can share some data around that. But no, that's, that's, and that's a modifiable behavior that we can actually intervene on. This, we can intervene possibly at a different level, but 100% true.